So our third uh, dialogue today is ranked choice voting from the political left, right, and center. It's going to be with Gene Massey and Dave Meslin. Uh, Paul Jacob, who was slated for this, uh, is ill today with that germ that seems to be going around. Um, but in a spirit of ranked choice voting, Dave is our second choice and in a great second choice. Uh, he's uh, all the way from Toronto, where uh, he and others have built a really vibrant movement um, uh, for ranked choice voting, which I'm sure he will discuss. Um, and uh, he runs a group called Rabbit there and is a, a real expert at the TED Talk and I think is, has some major TED Talk just about to come out. Um, Jean Massey is executive director of Fair Vote Minnesota. Uh, she spearheaded the adoption of, of uh, ranked choice voting in the public education campaign around it there and, and in, uh, in Minneapolis and St. Paul, which both use it, and is a leading expert in the state on electoral reform. Jean and Dave. Great. Thank Thanks, Rob. This is pretty exciting for us. We actually met in the strangest way about six years ago. I was um, really interested in doing voting reform in Toronto, and I just thought, I, I had these ideas about these ranked ballots, this would be neat. Is anyone doing this? So I Google it on Google, it wasn't that long ago, and, um, and I hear about this group in uh, Minneapolis who had just won a referendum, they're going to be doing it, and I'm in a band, and we were going on tour, and we were going to be stopping through Minneapolis. So I email Gene Massey, I go over for dinner, we have an amazing talk, and I leave with boxes of stickers and t-shirts and flyers and lawn signs, bring them back to Toronto, got everyone really excited and inspired, and now we're actually winning our campaign in Toronto, we're getting statewide, we call them provinces, province-wide legislation, enabling ranked ballots, but it all started with that dinner with you uh, in 2009. See, consultation works. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We're spreading the good word. Well, you're doing great work in Toronto, and we're so excited to see this kind of concept just blossom because it's something that voters really love, actually. And I'm going to talk about the Minneapolis experience that way. But I think first, Dave wants to make sure that we all understand ranked choice voting really well because it's very simple to use. Sometimes it's easier to learn something by seeing it happen in action, live. So if we could have two volunteers, can I invite the two of you up on stage? Are you guys into that? For a quick little demo, you and you, yeah, it'll be fun. Come up, come up. <laughs> Round of applause. Okay, what are your names, please? Oh, be careful. See, ranked ballots would, would have taken care of that. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle. Kyle, thanks for volunteering. Um, and you, sir? I'm Greg. Greg. <laughs> Greg and Kyle, thanks for being here. So we're having an election for mayor. Center stage, please. You're running for mayor. You want to get all the lights on you, the cameras. So the big issue of the day is glasses or no glasses. This is contentious, very contentious. So um, why should this city have a mayor with glasses? You have 20 seconds. Go. Glasses. You can see the people better. Yeah. <laughs> what else? Uh, it's easier to... Uh make distinctions between different things. Don't look at me, they're voting. Oh. <laughs> distinctions, okay. What's he talking about? We don't want a mayor with glasses, do we? What do we want? I think, uh, I think no glasses and bald is a much preferable option. <laughs> Why? You got 10 seconds to convince them. <laughs> you got one vote, you gotta get another, you know, bunch. Uh, there's nothing clouding away in my pretty blue eyes. Oh, there you go. Okay. So, that was obviously a shorter version of a long, grueling, two, three, four month campaign. The votes come in, hold that up with pride, this way, and um, here we go. All right, so 60% of the voters like this whole thing, Greg's whole thing about glasses. So, who's going to win this election? Why? You got more votes. Yeah, that's how democracy works. It's amazing. Democracy. First past the post. First past the post works amazing when you have two candidates. Um, Gene, do you want to run for mayor? I'd love to Great. run for mayor. Come on up. Come on up. So sometimes, sometimes women with sometimes glasses. There might, be, there might be more than two people in a city who want to run for mayor. I don't know. Is that crazy? Why do we want a mayor with glasses? Well, because I'm, I'm a woman. It's, a, you know, it's time for women to be in office. I'm prettier. With glasses? Good enough? All right. So, you're pretty too. Don't worry about it. Oh, don't, don't take worry. that. See, that's negative. That was an attack ad right there. <laughs> there was an implication there about your prettiness. I heard it. Um, so, what happens here is the folks with glasses have two options. 
They're still at 60%, so let's just do a little. Okay, 35 plus 25. All right, 60% still want glasses, so they're going to win, right? Oh, who's going to win now? Blue eyes. Blue eyes, <laughs> that's right. So he's going to win this mayoralty race even though the majority of the city want a mayor with glasses. So that's the mathematical problem with vote splitting. And, but the real thing, I want to be really clear, and Gene's going to talk more about this. When you switch to a system that prevents this, it doesn't just change the math. It changes who runs, how they run, and how people vote. So let's, let's back up history a bit. Can you just walk backwards about five feet? Backwards, OK. And hold this again. So what's going to happen as rumors start spreading in the, in the glasses community? Sorry, you don't want a zero. You can put that back together. Okay. What's going to happen within the community of, of glasses people okay. when they start hearing rumors that Gene's going to run? So right now, they know the polling is showing a clear Greg victory here. I heard Gene's running. Gene's running for glasses. Love her. You love her, yeah. But don't run. Why? Don't split the glasses vote. Nothing could be more toxic in the political culture than telling the most enthusiastic people who want to run, put their name on the ballot, that they're somehow ruining democracy by participating and running. And then, of course, we tell people that even if she does, even if Gene says, well, screw these people. I don't care if I'm going to split it. I'm running. I'm running. Tell them. Now we're going to have people within the glasses community saying, yeah, we like Gene, but... You know, he was in first, she's going to split the vote, or vice versa. We've got to figure out who's got the real chance of winning and make sure you don't vote for the spoiler. Of course, I really feel it's my turn. Yeah. And people will vote for me. I'm a woman. So how does a runoff work? In a runoff system, which is a very common system used all over the place, what you do is if no one gets a majority in the first count, as you heard, uh, the candidate with the least votes, sorry, my friend, in this case it's you, is eliminated from the race. Just don't go away. Round of applause, though, for Greg. <laughs> and if you're doing a multi-round runoff, you would tell everyone to come back and say, OK, everyone, vote again. Now you've got two choices. But when you've already ranked your choices one, two, three on the ballot, we know on each of your ballots who their second choice is. And of course, they're going to go to Jean. The votes go back together. Jean's going to get 60. And she wins because most of the city wanted a candidate with glasses. But most importantly, everyone was allowed to run. All of you were able to vote with your heart. And most importantly, the campaigning becomes more positive. Because when the three of you are running under the current system, first past the post, you only go up if someone else goes down. That's the negative ads. That's the attacks. Under a runoff, you want to make sure that you get lots of first choices. But you're really going to win if you also have second choices. So any negative attack is going to backfire. So that's how a runoff works. That's how it makes sure that we have more choice, more options. You vote with your heart and more positive campaigns. Round of applause for our volunteers. So Jean can talk right more about what, how it's actually playing out in Minneapolis. If we had more time, I would also share this with you, which is when I, I do this with high schools, it shows an 80-20 split. Which way is it? The eight. In an 80-20 split, where you have an incumbent mayor who's only got 20% support, and if a whole bunch of people run against him or her, uh, you can win with 20. We currently have a city councilor in Toronto who is elected with 17% of the vote. This actually happens. So Gene is a pioneer, a leader in North America of fixing this, and you brought it to Minneapolis. So um, tell us a bit about how you did that and how it's going. Well, I love to tell the story of Minneapolis because it's a very exciting one. So thanks for having me to come and share that. And all I can say about Toronto is the sooner you get it, the better. <laughs> And I think that's true for a lot of cities. So Minneapolis adopted ranked choice voting in 2006 by a local referendum. And that's typically how it's done in the cities that have adopted ranked choice voting across the country, in the Bay Area and, under, and in other cities. And St. Paul, its neighboring city across the river, soon followed with adoption in 2009. So both cities in Minnesota now have had two election cycles where they've actually used ranked choice voting. And the experience has gone very smoothly and very successfully. In 2013, the Minneapolis popular mayor, R.T. Rybeck, stepped down after 12 years in office. That opened up the door for an open mayor's race the first time in three terms. And we knew that it was going to be a big test of how ranked choice voting really works. 
Ranked choice voting is valuable when you have three or more candidates running, and it fosters that kind of choice on the ballot. So it's not pertinent in every race. If you have a popular incumbent running, you won't have the kind of competition against that candidate that really requires a, a voter to rank in that race. But this race was going to be special, and we knew that. And Fair Vote Minnesota uh, raised funds to do a lot of the public education, not just with voters and making sure voters understood the process, but also to help candidates run effective ranked choice voting campaigns and to help the media, importantly, understand the new process as well so that they were following the story and telling the story in the right way. In the end, on election day, after election day, we did some polling, and it's been verified by some polling by National Fair Vote and some other organizations that illustrated um, how easy this process was for voters to understand. And that's critical for us to communicate because the first concern people raise about a change in the process is it will be complicated. And it's not. So now we've seen in cities across the country just how easy it is for voters, and this election proved that. 88% of the voters ranked their ballots in the mayor's race. And this is a big city. We had 80-some thousand voters um, vote in the mayor's race. 88% ranked their ballot. 78% ranked all three options. So that meant that voters not only wanted and liked the process of ranking their preferences, it meant that they really understood the value of doing that. As Dave was explaining, if your first choice isn't going to count or is defeated early in the runoff process, your backup choices can count, and that's very empowering for voters, and they love it. We asked them, do you like the system, and 85% of voters, and this is across all income levels, across all age groups, across all ethnic groups, said, yes, we understand and like how this process works, and they want to continue to use it. And they'd love to see this used in the state context as well. So we're building that understanding so that we can grow it to a statewide initiative at some point in the future. The other aspect of ranked choice voting that we came to see in this mayor's race, because it was such a good test, was just how much the changes in incentives in ranked choice voting produce different kinds of outcomes. And I want to speak to three or four of those in particular. First, it promoted more choice. Now, in this case, some of you may know, Minneapolis had a 35 candidate ballot. And that was because for 20 bucks and a cause, you could get your name on the ballot. But 35 candidates didn't become that real number. It got down to about six or seven candidates who were the ones on stage doing the debates. There were some 34 debates, and there was real choice in that election. For the first time in probably four decades in anyone's recent political memory, there was a real conservative viable candidate. That hadn't happened in a one-party town in decades because under the old primary system, anyone but two Democrats couldn't get through. So for the first time, we saw that real choice on the ballot, and that crossed the political spectrum from conservative to Green Party to Democrats. And there were many Democrats on the ballot because there was no endorsement. So there was such rich choice for voters. And voters loved that choice and ranked their preferences on the ballot. So that's the first thing that it did. The second thing that it did was require the candidates to reach all voters, because getting enough first choice votes would never get to 50%. So candidates knew that they had to ask voters for second choices and third choices in order to win, and it meant that they got to talk to all voters. And no one was written off if they were on a phone call and they said, well, I'm going to vote for your opponent first. Well, here's why I'd like you to vote for me as a second choice. And that's a very powerful shift in the dynamic for both candidates and voters. And voters said, oh, I had all these candidates talking to me. And they, and they all felt I mattered. That's empowering. And so I think what I'd like to do is just have you hear from the winner in that election, Mayor Betsy Hodges, who can speak quite eloquently to how that really mattered in her campaign and I think how it speaks to how she won in that race. So we'll just watch a small video clip of her, and then I'll come back and talk a bit more about that election. And what it meant uh, as a candidate was that the, the campaign was remarkably positive. There, there was relatively little elbowing and attacking. There was some, but relatively little, because, of course, every candidate wanted to be the second choice 
of their opponent's supporters. So I, if you and I were running against one another in ranked choice, I want the second choice votes of your supporters. So if I'm talking smack about you, it's not going to go well for me in the ballot box. <laughs> Uh, so as a candidate, it also played to my history background and um, uh, complete uh, what I would do anyway, which is a grassroots campaign, because you, ha you can't just play to your base. You have to be in the entire community if you're successfully going to win a ranked choice voting election. Um, and I ended up on 70 percent, uh, 64 percent, I guess it was, 64, 65 percent of the ballots in the city of Minneapolis. Um, now, uh, I'm from Minnesota, so I'm probably going to get in trouble back home for saying this, but in the end, once all the votes were tallied and all mm -hmm. the votes had been transferred, I won by 18 percent, which was surprising to a lot of people. On the first ballot, I was ahead by a significant amount, but what it meant was that um, the second choice strategy that we had worked. You really had to be positive and you really had to go everywhere and ask people's vote. What it also means is I have a clear clear indication from the community that the message I was carrying was one that they supported. That not only did my initial supporters support that vision, but the people who came, you know, people who supported someone else um, but liked what I had to say, they also liked what I had to say. And it's made governing uh, really clear about where the coalitions are and that there was widespread support for what I was, uh, for the message that I was carrying. And that's how I see it. I was, I was carrying a vision, carrying a set of values for people, and that was supported by the city. So it's made governing um, uh, it's made it's mattered in governing because there's a lot of people on the team. There's a lot of people on the team over here. Thank you. And to this day, once now that she's been a year into office, she really is aspiring to represent and be accountable to a very broad constituency. She is governing that way. It's pre, it's it's fun to watch that process play out. Betsy Hodges is the second female mayor to be elected to Minneapolis, and I want to speak to the diversity that ranked choice voting promotes, not just candidates on the ballot. So I said that we, for the first time, had a conservative viable candidate who brought issues to the forums that uh, we have a, a share of the population really, really wants to hear and to be able to vote on. That candidate didn't win, but it was critical that he was a part of the process. And in fact, he and Betsy became very good friends on the campaign trail. And my guess is he's visiting her in her, in her, in her office often. The election also was, um, had several council races. All of the city council, 13 of them, were up for election. And the election elected the first Somali candidate, the first Latina candidate, and um, another, um, in another race, a, a women candidate. So it promotes the kind of diversity and choice in the process that we hadn't seen before in Minneapolis, which is so important. She spoke to how this incentivizes more civility. And it does. It really defeats negative campaigning in a very significant way. And importantly in the process, it keeps the issues focused on policies that matter to the citizens. They become more substantive, the discussions do, and they become policy driven. And that's what voters got to hear and got to vote on in election day. I want to speak to one aspect that we were surprised happened to the degree it did. We were watching, we were hoping that it might put a dent in campaign financing, and it put a bigger dent in campaign financing than we thought. The two leading campaigns for mayor had PACs. It was a very significant race. The leading opponent uh, with Betsy Hodges raised three and a half times and spent that much in their PAC. So it wasn't money that defined the success in that race. It was grassroots campaigning and asking for first, second, and third choice votes. And it shows how that kind of strategy is more successful and trumps money in winning a campaign under ranked choice voting. And we're anxious to see other elections play out to see if this kind of continues. But we really saw it play out. and We've seen that happen in other cities as well. So we're hopeful that this is a backdoor sort of way to impact campaign finance. And then I just want to highlight that because of the kind of campaign that that was, and the political coalition that we've been able to build around ranked choice voting, there has been support from all of the political sides on this issue. From the Democratic Party, 
Um, it's in the party platform. The Republican Party, while it's not in the platform, there's growing support from within the party for ranked choice voting. The Independence Party in Minnesota has formally adopted it, the Libertarian Party, the Green Party. It's very important in these kinds of reforms to build the kind of political coalitions that we that need to embrace a change in elections. And we've been able to accomplish that because we've been able to implement it and people have seen that it brings the kind of benefits to the process that voters and parties like to see. So Jean's enthusiasm was contagious for me and I took it to Toronto where it's happening and I guess I'll just finish off by saying that I hope uh, it's contagious for you as well. And I'm hoping to see this spread all across the states and North America. And thank you for inspiring me six years ago. Well, and thanks for taking it, Toronto. And, and, and Minnesota was inspired by the work of Rob Ritchie and Steve Hill in California and other cities that have come before us. I had the opportunity by chance to speak to Mayor Betsy Hodges last night. And she shared this. She said, Jean, if we lead, they will follow this kind of good idea. And I think that's what we, what we will see in other cities to come. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.